Justin has been leading the Smithsonian Gardens Orchid Collection since 2018. He earned his bachelor's in plant science from the School of Integrated Plant Science at Cornell University and has acquired experiences from botanic gardens across the U.S. and abroad. Justin firmly believes that he wouldn't be here today if it weren't for horticulture and its ability to help us transcend limitations we place upon others and ourselves. Horticulture naturally invokes inclusion and invites all to feel welcome. And with that, welcome Justin. Awesome. Thank you all so much uh, for joining this talk today in this conversation. Um, just like many, I adore orchids and I hope to share some insights that can help you to grow orchids at your home and have them thrive. Um, just be, well, I do have two dogs at home, so they might uh, decide to jump in. So just be aware. Um, hopefully they'll be quiet. Um, but thank you. And we'll start the presentation. So as uh, Grace said, um, I am the lead horticulturalist within the Smithsonian Garden Orchid Collection um, here in Washington, DC. I have been in this uh, role for almost five years now, and I have really loved, become to adore this collection that I have been able to steward. And with the collection itself, we have a little over 5,000 orchids within our collection. And our goal is to preserve them for generations to come to ensure all can enjoy um, these orchids that we have in our living collections. So the agenda today, uh, we'll go over, uh, just talk briefly about the collaboration that the U.S. Botanic Garden and Smithsonian Gardens has been partaking in for over 27 years, which is our annual orchid uh, exhibition um, collaboration. Uh, and I'll go over the Smithsonian Garden Orchid Collection. You'll see a few images. And then we'll go over uh, our acronym that helps us guide our collection and our stewardship plan. And then a quick orchid introduction. And then the types of orchids that are commonly available that you may see in the trade. And then your growing conditions, light, water, temperature, pests, virus challenges that you may occur. And then also a brief intro of repotting and the various mediums um, that you can utilize. And then the common orchid requirements that you would might be use it, utilizing at your home environment or want to learn more about. And then we'll open it to a Q&A. Most of the images you see at this, um, in this presentation have been um, captured by our living collections photographer, Hanalei Latte. And so I definitely invite you to enjoy these images um, as I scroll through the, the presentation. So this collaboration that I was talking about, uh, 27 years long, um, and we have our current exhibition, the U.S. Botanic Garden, is um, Discover the World of Orchids. So I definitely would encourage if you're local to D.C. or plan on traveling to D.C., the exhibition and show is happening now and will end on April 30th. And so I definitely would go check that if, if you have time. And then last year, uh, we actually did, uh, the Smithsonian Gardens hosted um, Orchids, Hidden Stories of Groundbreaking Women that was in the Kogod Courtyard at the National Portrait Gallery and the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Definitely a wonderful exhibition that was put on and it definitely after the hiatus from being closed during COVID, it was definitely welcome. Uh, we do have um, links uh, to our website that will be provided uh, during this chat that I would definitely encourage you to go on a virtual tour of this previous exhibition. So the Smithsonian Garden Orchid Collection. Um, so this is a bird eye view of just one of the greenhouses that manage this collection. And this is one uh, collection that houses all the items that are warm and hot growing. So the temperatures in here do ne never get below 71 degrees, even during the night. Um, so you can imagine it feels like DC or the tropics all year round, which is definitely welcome when it comes to the cold uh, DC area. And so all the collection items you can see here are appropriately spaced to ensure that we give each item the correct care that it requires. We also have a database that manages all the growing conditions. It notifies us. We're able to track the health of the plant um, to ensure that we're growing the plants as best as we possibly can when it comes to conservation and preserving for generations to follow. 
So um, when it comes to stewarding our collection, we have devised various uh, pillars that we abide by when it comes to stewarding our collection, acquiring new items, deaccessioning um, items within the collection, aka the removal of items from our living collections. So those are conservation, outreach, display, innovation, and education. So we, thr uh, we strive to ensure that every collection item fits within these collecting goals, also known as CODI, because we do like our acronyms. I know I do. So orchids, um, what makes them so unique is they're found on every continent besides Antarctica. There's over 38 to 30 thousand uh, species that are naturally occurring and found all over the world. And these items uh, are naturally occurring. They grow from the mountaintops all the way down to the mangroves to the ocean and the seas. So they are, have been able to really, you know, colonize various areas, all different ecosystems all throughout the world. Um, and People have had a long history of being connected to orchids. So, for example, Confucius grew orchids in 500 BC. And there's a lot of uh, biocultural connections that a lot of orchids have to indigenous cultures, uh, nations, um, and people all over this planet. And then there's also the notion of hybrid. So this is a non-naturally occurring plant, uh, mostly human um, created or cultivated. And so these are plants that, um, just similar to agriculture, have taken one plant and then crossed it with another to have the combination of genes to get a different outcome. So it's crossing compatible orchids together, as you could imagine, with such large um, diversity of orchids. Not all orchids are going to be compatible. But over the last 200 years, many people have been having fun and crossing various plants to ensure and to test if they're actually compatible and coming up with new color combinations, fragrances, size, longevity. And there's over 110,000 registered hybrids, which is managed by the Royal Horticulture Society um, in the UK. And you can pretty much view all the pro progeny of those particular plants and the history and the historic value of those particular plants. The first hybrid that has been documented um, was 1858. So that was the first time a hybrid was um, created, well, which is pretty cool. So when it comes to the history, that's all been documented. And there's orchids named after the icons that we have known to love. Um, the orchid here in the corner, the bright fuchsia one, the Cattleya or the Corsage orchid, is actually Betty Ford, so named after one of the first ladies. And they're always creating new combinations and traits. So what makes an orchid? So a lot of people have a innate love and uh, connection to orchids, mostly because of the, their appearance from their flamboyant colors, their displays, the fragrances, but really it's that bilateral symmetry that we've no come to know. When you look at an orchid, if you were to cut it in the middle, just like the human face, it mirrors the same side. So you can see um, with this hybrid here, um, orange ember, Santa Barbara, if I was to cut it down, it would mirror the other side. So it gets definitely a um, personality or a, a human-like appearance that people can connect with. Then the floral parts. Um, so most taxonomically, most orchids um, and also plant families were always divided based on floral parts. Um, due to recent changes in uh, technology when it comes to sequencing, some of that nomenclature has changed. But orchids have become, have stayed the same as orchids, not taxonomically, they've changed different genera. But they all contain various combinations and modifications of these particular parts, whether it's the stamens, the pistils are fused, forming a column. The uh, three steeples uh, consist of a dorsal and two laterals, two separate petals, and a modified one called the labellum, aka the landing pad. And you can see in this orchid hybrid, you can see where the insect would be drawn and where your actually your eye is naturally drawn. And just keep in mind, these are all modified. So you'll see an orchid flower next to another one, and you're like, how is that an orchid? But they all contain uh, the same floral parts on a botany level. 
And then the seeds are generally, they contain very little endosperm, aka the reserves that are found in seeds. And so they're very small dust-like. One pod of an orchid could actually contain millions of tiny seeds. And the pollen masses are called polline or, um, pollinium or plural pollinia. And you can see here is a catacetum species, and this is the male flower, and you can see on my finger there is a uh, pollen sacs um, that you can see on my hand, and those are the globules of pollen that um, if an insect was to come, it would grab that and then go to another flower and then cross the pollination would, would occur. So the basic types of orchids that you may or may not have seen in your box stores um, are the Phalaenopsis, aka the moth orchid, the Cymbidium, the boat orchid, the Dendrobian, the Cattleya that I previously mentioned, the Corsage orchid, the Oncidium, the Dancing Lady orchid, and my personal favorite, the Tropical Asian Lady Slipper, Papiopetalum. And so when we come to look at, and as we grow um, various orchids, um, we get to know what the growing conditions are. And over the years, over the years that uh, people have been culture th culturing them in their home or in a greenhouse or working with scientists in universities, the light levels, um, you know, whether it's light levels, water, nutrients have all gone through various rigorous processes to ensure that you can cultivate your orchids. And all the, the types I mentioned before, they all are associated with various um, requirements. And so for light, general, um, there's an indicator. So when you look at your plant, the plant can't communicate the same way we communicate, but it can show visual indic indicators that will allow us to make recommendations to improve the plant's health. So for example, light, um, they need it for photosynthesis, so they make their own food. And so if an orchid, generally speaking, if it's bright green leaves, it indicates a happy, healthy plant. If it's dark green leaves, this is a signal that the plant is not giving, getting enough light. And then if it's a yellow, green, or a red, indicates that it might be getting too much light. And so this will show that the plant is actually forming anthocyanins that is a natural sunblock um, in the, on a cellular level but um, you know, you might it might be too much light, so the plant is not able to produce um, flowers or grow um, as well as it possibly could. And then I always say, um, you know, the number one thing is I always get people asking me uh, ice cubes. Um, please, from a professional standpoint, do not use ice cubes on your orchids. Um, this is not scientifically accurate when it comes to the best care of orchids. Um, it's just one of those things you, you wouldn't like to be, unless you're in a sports and it's part of your therapy, you would not want to be dipped in an ice bath. Most of the orchids that we cultivate are grow from in tropical regions that do not get below 55 degrees. So you can imagine putting ice cubes is not the best way. Um, in the future slide, I'll go over the whole um, method of watering that I've utilized and had great success with in the home. Watering. Um, so watering is one of the most reasons why orchids do fail um, in the, the home environment. It's either too much water, not enough water, or you're using ice cubes or not um, have a regimen. So really the first steps that I've broken down is determining that your orchid needs water. So how do you do this? So usually if you're looking at the plant and you're lifting it up, if it's light, um, that's usually a good indication. Or if the leaves look a little less green or turgid, aka nice filled with water, if they look a little limp, you're gonna wanna ensure that that plant gets water. Um, I usually do on a rotational. So I usually do every seven to 10 days in a general rule of thumb to ensure your plant gets watered. Um, so it's really, you know, really about the time from when you first watered it and then to the, the next time that it's going to need water. So you'll get to know your orchid as you start to observe um, how it handles your home based on if your plant is 
um, your home is dry or if it's uh, moist or you have uh, high light levels or prominent air circulation. So it all depends, but with a few tips in observing, um, you can definitely have an orchid that thrives in your home. The third, uh, second step is to bring your orchid to the sink or an area where you can let it drain. And so I recommend bringing it to your sink and letting it flush out. Um, these are you know, plants that grow, most of them are epiphytic, meaning growing on another surface. So they'd grow on a palm tree or a tree versus a terrestrial, which would go on the ground. But you want to ensure that there is gas exchange. And if you're using fertilizers, if there's any buildup of soluble salts, that those salts can be um, removed from the pot so it doesn't come toxic it doesn't become toxic for that particular plant. So when you're bringing it to the sink, you're letting it really flush through and that's helping keep the plant healthy and bringing oxygen um, and gas uh, exchange to the roots when you do that. And then feeding is also something that's overlooked, but you can make it really easy. Um, I usually recommend getting a general fertilizer. It doesn't have to be anything fancy, but if you already have something that's labeled as orchid, that's totally fine. And what I usually do is I recommend a 10% rate of what um, the fertilizer recommends. So you're going to do a very weak concentration of the fertilizer. And I usually just take a four to six ounce, so even a shot glass, and you just have a gallon jug that you've already mixed the fertilizer in. After you're done doing the watering process, you just take some of that liquid fertilizer and then put it in the pot after you've done the drench. And that allows it to adhere to the bark and the roots that have been saturated by the water um, to ensure that it's able to absorb um, through the root system. And it allows that you're not overfeeding your particular plant. I generally recommend if your light levels um, are good, I would recommend fertilizing from spring all the way to fall. And then I usually let my orchid rest um, with fertilizers uh, during the winter months. And then you bring it back, you allow it to drain in the sink, and then bring it back to your windowsill. Temperature is also a thing. The recommendation usually that I say for most of the orchids that are have been hybridized or growing or recommended for the home environment is if you're comfortable, the orchid is probably comfortable. Of course, there are a few exceptions to the rules since there is such a wide diversity of plants that you can possibly cultivate. And this is broken down into various recommendations warm, intermediate, and cool. All these temperatures are associated with um, getting plants to bloom, to thrive um, through the general and the natural circadian rhythm that most of these orchids have come to um, grow and thrive in. Pests um, that most people get, um, sometimes you bring an orchid home or you get it from someone or a gift and it comes with little hitchhikers um, that you might have to address. And so some common pests that I also deal with and other people deal with is um, mealybug, which also looks like a little, like a cottony mass. And you'll see those mostly in the nodes or the right in the leaves of the particular orchid. Um, they feed um, with their uh, piercing sucking mouth parts and they cause distortion and can spread uh, various pathogens um, when it comes to your orchid. And it's just, they look really nasty. Um, when you zoom into them, they kind of look something out of a sci-fi film. There's also scale, um, which you can see a high res that I took of the, a particular scale. You can see it's kind of like an armored plate. And then those next to it are all the little next generation. So the little um, juveniles of this particular um, insect. And this feeds and pierces and creates these nasty cotton masses under leaves usually of orchids and really can cause um, severe damage to your orchid. The other is thrip. And so uh, thrips are awful. They're definitely one of my number one enemies when it comes to orchids. They can be found in the house, but they're less likely, um, but you can get them if you have other plants around, um, for example. And these particular plants love flowers and they love bright colors, um, especially yellow. And then you have the common aphid, um, which will generally feed um, on your plant. And it, they're, they are kind of cute, I, I will admit, but they will pierce and create distortions in your particular orchid. All of these pests um, can be handled by over-the-counter remedies that you probably have in your, at your house. 
Um, the number one is the physical removal of them. Um, if you're, you know, even if you have, I usually use a peppermint soap. And so the peppermint soap has, um, usually contains a surfactant, a detergent, and has peppermint oil and the peppermint oil will will dry out the exoskeleton of a lot of these insects and then you're having the uh, the soothing properties of the detergent to kind of just wash away and break down the particular uh, the outer coating of the insect so you can really get into the insect to dry it out um, so I would re recommend using a liquid peppermint soap that you can find. And most of those peppermint soaps will have a recommended rate for plants. Um, so definitely read the label. Um, the label is the law. So please follow that. Um, using a cotton ball or a Q-tip, you can remove the insects or, um, that you're, you're being challenged with. And then there's also rubbing alcohol. And you're going to want to dilute that. Um, I usually recommend a 10% solution. And that you can just spray and that will dry the buggers right out. So that's definitely a really good way um, to dry that out. And then orchid virus, we always like to, I always like to talk about because it's um, definitely with managing a large scale collection. I also look at it as a collection, even if you have a lot of uh, plants, it's kind of like a, a Petri dish. Um, you know, anything that will be there might be there. So viruses, um, just like you and I can contract viruses and in agriculture, you may have heard, um, viruses can um, really dra drastically, uh, you know, eradicate a collection or the health of a plant. And so orchids are, no different. Um, here are some images of plants that have um, come down to uh, with various viruses. Uh, we do test for two viruses, um, ORSV and Cymbidium mosaic virus. And those particular viruses have been researched and um, they are the top two that are detrimental to health of orchids. So with viruses, just like you and I, we can live with viruses. We can also thrive with viruses or the viruses can also uh, lead to succumb of you know, our health and our life. So similar to orchids, certain orchids can have a virus. You don't notice, they, they're wonderful, they bloom. While other ones, they get it and within two weeks they're dead. So it's one of those things um, when it comes to viruses, it's something to be aware of. There are virus test kits that uh, anyone can purchase to just survey their collections, um, just to ensure that they're healthy. Um, but for most commercial or people who are in the home, they don't too much have to worry about orchid viruses. But if you see a plant that looks symptomatic and you're not too much attached to it, I would recommend discarding the plant and then replacing it with a healthier, more vigorous plant. And then repotting. So taking care of your plant um, is key. So as you might have um, heard, as you should repot an orchid every so often, um, I recommend every two to three years. This is typically when the uh, media, so the growing media, if it's bark um, or moss, tends to break down um, in the home environment. So that's usually when I typically recommend to repot. So you can see a few examples um, here in number two. Um, you see, it, I call it octopusing. So it looks like an octopus's tendrils. And so this is an orchid that is trying to find moisture. So it's trying to grow out to capture the moisture in the air. Number one, you can see it physically breaks the pot. And then number three, you can see that it's growing outside the pot. So it's like an iris, it's growing outside its limited container. As you can think, these are kind of like a zoo animal. They're in their little, little confinement, but if they grow or want to, they're gonna try to get out of that container that they've been growing in. And then four, you can see, if you were to smell that, it smells of just rotten decay matter. And that's an example of a cymbidium orchid that has gone a little too long. So you can see that the bark media has broken down and it's become, become aer aerobic. So there's no oxygen that's able to um, allow for that perfect gas change between the roots and the plant. And so general tips, um, you know, if there's growing, if it has new growth, that's a great time to repot. I normally recommend after a plant flowers, that's when I usually um, will repot it. And that's usually when the orchid has given all its energy for flowering and then it's starting its new growth cycle um, to ensure that uh, the plant is um, able to recoup more energy by growing more leaves, et cetera.
And then I would, um, you know, refrain from repotting plants directly into the Swiss cheese pots or glazed pots. So these are the pots that have a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of holes um, and uh, the media usually just falls right out. So I would definitely not, um, you know, I'd recommend not repotting those um, in those pots. You can always put them in a plastic pot and then put them in the decorate um, pot. And then uh, containers, um, they must contain drain holes. So if you have a plant that is in a, uh, in a pot, um, you want to ensure that it has uh, drain holes to allow for that proper uh, gas exchange when you are watering it. And then materials. So you're going to want to just like any sh good chef would do is they would gather all their materials. Um, so, you know, different pots, um, plastic versus terracotta. You have your sphagnum moss. You have the mixture that has a combination of bark, charcoal, and uh, perlite. And then you have your cutting instruments and tools that you would utilize during potting. And so depending on um, your orchid that you're growing, uh, most common um, stores will have mixes that are already fabricated and made for orchids. Um, so there's usually a bark mix, and then there's another one that just has moss. Um, I usually recommend, definitely for the typical home grower, I always recommend the bark mix because you can definitely um, allow it to go into the sink and then it can really flush out um, and keep your plant nice and healthy. It's a little harder to do if um, the plant is in sphagnum moss um, and that tends to rot. And once it goes sour, it really goes sour very fast. So I would um, recommend when you have an orchid, when you first get it home, I would recommend removing it after it's done flowering uh, from the moss and then putting it into a bark mixture um, I don't have any recommend recommendations to any brands um, when it comes to bark, um, but I would just, you know, go to your local store and also ask, ask people at the common stores um, what they, what they have and what they can possibly get you. So different steps when it comes to uh, growing orchids, um, you know, when it comes to the repotting. Uh, number one is gather your materials, like I mentioned. Um, you can see number two, this is an example of a Phalaenopsis that stayed a little too long in its pot, and so it started to decay. And so the next step, after a few other steps, you're going to want to take it out of its pot, you're going to bring it to the sink, and you're going to flush it out and get all that extra media that is attached, um, all the bark that is attached, and then you want to rinse it to get all that media out um, of that particular plant. So when you put it into its new home, you wanna ensure that it has a fresh medium and a fresh start. Because when you repot, most of the plants, they're gonna be triggered. They're gonna be triggered to grow new roots and to um, you know, really grow into their new home environment to, upstart, to start taking those nutrients and allow for um, new development. And then five here, I'm putting in the pot. I would recommend, you know, if you're doing a plastic pot, which I would recommend for the home, You'll have your pot, you're gonna put it, you can even put it in the same pot. What will determine what pot and what size you particularly put it in is gonna be this, the amount of roots that are in, uh, that are, that plant has developed. You never wanna overpot your orchid. It's not like a goldfish. If you put it in a big bowl, it's not gonna get bigger. It's actually gonna rot and decay. So I recommend always go on the conservative side when it comes to the size of the plant that you're, you're using. And then you can see eight here, once you, put the mix in. I usually never put the orchid mix in and then put the plant, you put the plant in, you're holding with your fingers and then you put the media in and then you give it a little shimmy and then use your hands and fingers to give it a nice press. You're gonna wanna press it down and I wanna hear a nice granola crunch when you're pressing. So this allows for the orchid to be stabilized. As it's getting accompanied or um, acclimatized to its new home, the more it moves, the less likely it's going to be um, attached to the bark mix. So you really want to ensure that it's definitely fastened um, within within that pot. So you can see in number eight, I'm actually lifting the plant up, and it's able to hold without it falling and making a mess. And don't be scared. These orchids, most of the ones that you grow in home, they're used to being handled in a rougher way. Orchids are delicate, a lot of people think, but when it comes to their culture, certain orchids can be handled um, in quite a vigorous way. So um, I'll quickly go over some of the common orchids 
that um, we use, uh, that we you may have or be growing. And so you can see some of these images that we have from our collection. And so the, the boat orchid, which um, is the cymbidium, this is um, from a subtropical parts of Asia and parts of Australia. And they produce these long lasting flowers that can be quite large um, and they last a long time. And these plants are larger, so they're not the best for the home. They can get very large and in charge um, in no time. And you can see this plant has a beautiful display, whether it's a standard, which is right up, or a pendulous, which is pictured here. And then these are light loving um, orchids. Um, you can also visit Smithsonian Gardens. We have care sheets um, that you can go and we have it broken down in the various genera that I'm breaking down right now. And we have our recommendations. So, um, you know, you just, and also these, this will be recorded. So it'll be available at a later date. So you can, you can write down notes, but this will be available at a later date. So don't worry if this is a lot of information. Um, they're light loving. Uh, temperatures, these can grow a little cooler. They need a cool temperature. So this would be something that you put out in your, your uh, sunroom or an area where you get a little draft. Um, they do require a little temperature change to get them to flower. And then your humidity levels. So the amount of water vapor that has been dissolved or is present in the air. Um, then temperatures, of course, I mentioned the humidity, and then your mod watering is moderate. Um, so really depending on the growth of the plant, um, it does require a little more water when it's an active growth. And then here's some more pictures. This is a species cymbidium that we have in our orchid collection. And then it's all attached with your fertilizers. Um, so I have various amounts depending on the growing season. Usually during the growing season, which I mentioned is from spring to fall, that's when you're going to want to be constantly watering. When you're watering, you're also fertilizing. So you're ensuring that the plant gets um, the most fertilizer that it can possibly get. With this particular orchid, you're wanna, going to want to do a slow release fertilizer. Um, this allows for even more food because it really does require a little more um, nutrients than the other orchids. And then repotting, of course, as I mentioned, similar the two um, to three years. And then I have a mix uh, recommendation here as well um, that goes through the parts um, that you'd want to get um, when it comes to the, the mixes. And then notes, pretty much going over grooming and how you groom the plant and then removal of flowers as well. You're going to want to cut the stake back to um, where it arose from. And then my favorite one that I mentioned is the Pathiopetalum, so the tropical Asian lady slipper. And these are terrestrial, so they grow on the ground. And their light levels are a little bit lower. And so you're going to want to put it in a slightly shadier um, east, south, or west window. If you have a lot of exposure, you can always move it away from the window. So if you have a lot of light, no fear, you can just move it a little bit away from the window if it's a plant that requires a little less light, or if you've noticed that uh, the plant is getting too much light. And then temperatures, pretty much if you're comfortable, this plant is comfortable, and humidity. Um, with some orchids, you can also put humidity trays, so that pretty much is just a little dish, and you can have some marbles and pebbles that you sit the orchid on, and the water is not able to wick in the pot, but it gives that humidity around the plant as it evaporates. I know I appreciate some humidity. Um, so definitely you can also do humidity trays as well. And then water it. Um, you know, watering is pretty much when it comes to, the, um, uh, depending on the growth of the plant, um, it likes to dry out between waterings. And this is a beautiful hybrid. And this is one of my favorites, Ferrianum, so Pathipetalum Ferrianum. Um, and then fertilizing, it's going to be a moderate feed. So, you know, one time uh, per week when you're watering. And then you're going to lower the amount uh, once a month. And then repotting, um, these are plants that really don't like to, they like to be repotted. So you're going to want to do them every, every other year um, to ensure that the plant has proper media. Most of these particular plants, um, they do require, um, most of them are lithophytes as well. So they, uh, they benefit from extra calcium. So this is achieved by some crushed oyster shell that people you know, will add to the mix um, that we sure do. Um, but most hybrids that you're growing in the home environment, if you choose to, um, don't usually require the extra oyster shell. 
And then the other orchid is the corsage orchid, the cattleya orchid. And you can see by this flamboyant um, cattleya here, I mean, that, that color just it radiates. Um, these plants usually are giant um, and they were worn, of course, for corsages. So you'd have a beautiful fragrance and then you'd also have a beautiful adornment that you would wear. So these orchids um, definitely were famous for the corsage industry um, in the 1950s. Um, a lot of first ladies would wear cattleyas to certain events, State of the Union, opera. Um, if you were in New York and you wanted to be seen, you, you would actually have a cattleya um, that you would wear to go out to various events. Um, they're not as popular today, but I, I really do believe that they are fantastic uh, to have. Um, many florists, you can buy them um, now. So definitely recommend if you want to spice up your outfit, I would recommend a corsage orchid. Um, light levels. Um, so these are a little higher light levels. They're not the best um, for the home environment. Some people will actually substitute um, when it comes to um, when it comes to lighting. So they'll actually supplemental lighting that they'll use. So they'll have grow lights to help um, these plants along. Um, it's definitely not a plant I would recommend for a beginner or a person that doesn't have the qu correct home environment. If you are in a tropical region in the world, I definitely would recommend this plant. You can just stick it outside and kind of leave it and forget it, um, attach it to a tree. But if you're in northern states, um, I would probably not recommend this for the home environment because it can be a little more finicky. Um, in the same range of humidity, 50 to 80, you're, if you're comfortable, it's, or, it's comfortable. And this one really likes to dry out between waterings because you can see in this image, all the roots, it really likes to have a lot of air movement around the roots. And then this is a cattleya. This is a Gurianthe skinneri. This is a, a plant within the cattleya alliance, but absolutely a fabulous uh, plant. And then fertilizing, uh, moderate, it's gonna be the similar you know, feeding. Um, and don't, you know, if you miss a week, it's totally fine. But once you're on a regimen, you know, we are humans of habit and creatures of habit. So once you get on a, um, a um, you know, regimen, you can definitely um, go through that. Um, repotting every two years. Um, once the plant is usually over the edge, it will let you know. So that's time to repot. And then um, notes, uh, grooming, you're going to want to cut it down um, to the leaf where the leaf um, meets the inflorescence. And that's, that's where you will cut it. Um, that's also called where it sheaths, so a sheath. And that's where the plant, the flower will come out and emerge from. And then Oncidium, the dancing lady. Um, so these uh, are quite fun. Um, and so you can you can kind of see in the next slide, you'll see uh, where they get the name Dancing Lady. Um, it's kind of, we'll have like a skirt and then the, the arms. Um, so it, it's quite fun. Um, these are mostly from South America, Central America, Mexico, West Indies, and even Florida. So the topic of native orchids, um, not many people know that we have over 250 naturally occurring species in the continental United States, which is an interesting fact. Um, I definitely would recommend going to check out the North American Orchid Conservation Center, aka NAOC. And this was actually a, a collaboration with the U.S. Botanic Garden and Smithsonian and Smithsonian Gardens to form this collaborative conservation center. So, and that's goorchids.com. Um, so I would definitely recommend that uh, to learn more about uh, native orchids um, in North America. Um, back to the Oncidium. So light levels are moderate to high. This one you can get away with growing in the home. Um, it does need moderate light levels, though, so you want to ensure that you have either supplemental lighting or um, have a sunny window that you can put it in. And again, if it's you're comfortable, this plant will be comfortable. Um, humidity levels, this can go a little drier, so 40 to 70. And watering is moderate, and you water once a week. And then here's that you can see the dancing lady, and this is another one that you would... Um, you know, repot every two years, um, usually once the media breaks down. And uh, this plant, you would cut down the inflorescence um, all the way down to the node, um, and then it would bloom again on the next cycle once it produces a new growth. And then your Phalaenopsis. So this is the last, um, second to last one that most people grow, also known as the moth orchid. Um, this is the one you commonly see with 
you know, just add ice. Uh, well, it should be don't add ice, do not add ice. Um, this is an orchid that really helped start the, um, the Victorian era of orchid delirium. And this was an orchid that um, really captivated uh, audiences. And it's uh, one of the simplest orchids. I say simple, don't feel bad if you can't cultivate it. Um, this is an orchid that is commonly cultivated in the home. Uh, lower light levels, so it, it ranges, and this is one, if it's good in too much light, just move it away from the window. This likes it a little warmer, um, 70 to 85 degrees, um, moderate humidity, and um, this is similar. You're going to water once per week or every 10 days, depending on your growing conditions. And then this is the typical Phalaenopsis that you would see in your home. You can see it's octopusing a little in that pot and you can see the media is broken down, but there's an inflorescence coming. So if there's an inflorescence coming, wait until after it flowers. And then I would advise repotting that particular plant. When you're dealing with orchids that have exposed roots, the best way, um, especially with the Phalaenopsis, is you're gonna bring it to your sink, you're gonna wet it. And what that does is it softens the roots. So they're a little more pliable, so then you can, force it back into the pot, or if you get a larger pot, you're able to put it back into the pot um, to ensure that you're not breaking too many roots. If you break a few roots, that's totally fine. The plant will eventually recover and regenerate those roots. And this is a plant, once it breaks down, I would repot the media. And this one is a little, this is a little different. So um, with the inflorescence you can see coming out, it looks like an asparagus spear. After it's done flowering, it's not dead, all the flowers drop off. What I would recommend you, there's two ways that you can get more blooms. You can either wait a year for another inflorescence to start, or you can expedite that, possibly expedite that process by cutting just above a few nodes. So if you look at the stem, this, uh, the flower inflorescence, you're gonna count these little indentations. That's a node. So you'll count up one, two, three and you'll cut above the third one. And what that will do is it will produce auxins that, will, that may or may not trigger the orchid to have a little node that will form more flowers off that inflorescence. Um, but if not, you can just mow it down and then it will flower again um, in a roughly uh, one to two years. Some people can get them going all, all year long, depending on if you, once you get your routine um, down. Uh, dendrobians. So I saw someone in the chat mention dendrobian, uh, dendrobians, um, subtropical Africa, uh, Pacific Islands, Australia. This is a pretty large genus, so division of orchids, over a thousand species and numerous hybrids of many types and many abilities to grow and requirements. Most of these require a uh, little hot, heavier light levels. Um, their temperature ranges. Um, these ones like a dormant period, so they like to dry out a little in the winter. So um, if you're, you know, in the home, you can lessen the water. Some orchids uh, of dendrobians will actually shed all their leaves. They're deciduous, just like the trees um, in DC. Most of them, they'll lose all their leaves and then they'll regrow and generate new leaves with flowers. Um, so it really depends on what orchid, but most orchids and dendrobians have will have the care sheets um, that people uh, that you can follow, depending on since it is such a large genera. And then this is a beautiful Australian dendrobian from down under. And this is a fertilizer similar to the other orchids. And again, every two years or once the media or if the plant is at the edge of the pot um, growing. Um, this also likes a chunkier mix, so two parts medium bark, one part coarse bark, one part perlite, and one part medium charcoal. And then grooming, depending on the orchid, most of the dendrobians you're going to want to cut um, after they flower, uh, right down to where the pseudobulb is. And then, uh, this is the last slide, um, so I would love to open up to Q&A. Um, I know uh, the... You know, I know Grace has probably plenty of questions that we're going to start going over. And so we'll jump right in. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Justin. We do have a ton of questions, so I will just jump right in. We've got lots of questions related to feeding and fertilizer. Yes. And so someone is wondering, are orchid plant food sticks okay? I wouldn't recommend them. You know, you want to ensure, because what's going to happen is with the orchids, the fertilizing stick, it's just going to concentrate in one area. And if you have a root over here on the left of the pot and it's on the right, 
that root ain't getting the nutrients. So I would ensure. So what you could do with those, um, you know, if you have purchased them already, um, some of them are, they'll, they'll dilute in water. Um, so um, you can also dilute them in water and then just, you know, utilize, you know, until they're over. But I wouldn't recommend um, those particular sticks because it doesn't really get the breadth of what it really needs to do. Thanks, Justin. And could you recommend how often one would fertilize during spring and summer? Yeah, I would say every time you water. So if you're bringing it to your sink or you have it outside, um, every time you water, you know, week, weekly, or was it weekly, weekly, <laughs> or yeah, English, the English language is hard. Um, you get what I'm saying. What, weekly, but we, yeah, week, but weekly. There we go. <laughs> there we, it was somewhere in there. Okay. <laughs> Yep, I got it. Well, we'll put it in the chat too, so we'll know we'll know all the weeks we're talking about. Yeah, thank you, Justin. Um, and someone is trying to grow a vanilla orchid at home, and they're wondering if there are any unique fertilizer requirements. Um, I would just recommend a general. Um, we grow or a vanilla orchid in our uh, actually vanilla plantifolia, which is um, vanillas come from. We use a general fertilizer um, with that particular plant. Um, the, the trick with that is it has to get at least 20 feet long. Um, it's actually one of the vining genuses within Orchidaceae. Um, the vine actually has to get roughly 20 feet long before it actually will start producing flowers. Um, and then you get the vanilla fruit. Um, but that can be a little, it's fun. It's a fun, uh, definitely a talking piece. But yeah, no, no general recommendations for fertilizer. just a general, general feed. Awesome. Um, someone has a few mini orchids in a terrarium and they're worried that their mini orchids are being kind of overgrown by the moss in the terrarium. Should they worry about the moss or are they simpatico? Um, it depends. So I actually have a tr little terrarium at my house. Um, and what I usually do is I have a little piece of tweezer, little tweezer and a little scissor and I'll go through and just, you know, carve around the orchid just to make sure. Cause some of the orchids are very vigorous and they'll, they'll outrun the moss, right? Some won't. So I definitely would just recommend just keeping an eye and doing a little trim and, you know, upkeep because the orchids, moss is really cool, but the orchids are the star. So. Absolutely. Um, someone's got um, curly tendrils or roots coming out of their pot. Do they need to be cut? Um, so I would recommend repotting. And so when you repot, you're going to remove a lot of those dead roots, you know, going over to the sink, brushing your hands through a lot of the other roots will, you know, fall off if they're old. And then when you put the plot plant back in the pot, the roots will be, but generally I don't usually cut roots. Um, if there's an excess of roots and the plant is very vigorous, I would go ahead and give it a selective trim. So, you know, some long, some short, some long, some short, just like a nice little haircut. Perfect. Um, someone says that they have a large collection of orchids that stay vegetative with very little flowering. Um, they're recognizing after this talk that they may need more light, but they're curious if tempered water is okay between fertilizing. Yeah, so um, definitely more light. You know, you kind of, some orchids are triggered by stress. <laughs> so we call that a stress bloom. So you want to kind of you know, manipulate the orchid a little thinking that it might die, even though you know it's not going to, but you're going to stress it out. And then it's going to be like, I have to reproduce. So it's going to send energy to start flowering. So definitely the light I would definitely recommend and fertilizers as well. Um, tempered water is totally fine. Um, you never want to water your orchids with ice, ice cold water. Um, but, you know, tempered water, we water our collection. It's actually heated. Um, we heat it to 72 degrees Fahrenheit. So yeah, tempered water is totally fine. Thanks, Justin. And we have um, a couple folks who are really interested in terrarium growth. Um, do you have any general recommendations for growing orchids in a terrarium setting? Yeah, it's one of those things. Um, there's definitely a whole, there's Reddit, streams there's you know there's a big media present or um, online present when it comes to terrarium growing orchids um, there's definitely a lot of growers that specialize in mini orchids the key term is mini or micro mini orchid you don't want to try to put a standard orchid in a terrarium because uh, i've i did that mistake myself so even experts learn right um, you want to make sure that it's micro and or micro mini um, that's 
you know, to ensure. Um, so that's what my number one recommendation. And then just follow a lot of the um, vendors will have temperature recommendations when it comes to the mini orchids. Um, and usually when I'm using a terrarium, I would do distilled water, um, not city water, because that causes a lot of um, spotting on the, the glass or even uh, a buildup of minerals that you don't really necessarily want in the terrarium setting because you can't flush it, right? So it's a contained system. So just keep that in mind. Thank you so much, Justin. Um, we've got someone who's got um, a 21-year-old Cattleya orchid, and it's been divided several times. Some of the larger plants have leaves where blooms once were, and to make the larger plants smaller, can this person remove the older leaves um, to help it flower again? Or will it, is it done flowering, those older um, divisions? Yeah, so with most cattleyas, it's like an iris. I, I always like, they, they walk, right? They only flower on new growth. So once a flower, you have your leaves and then it flowers. Once that flower is done, that whole growth, that pseudo bulb, that's done. That's not going to flower again. The only time you're going to get flowers is towards the new growth. And so I usually recommend, excuse me, is removing, I count. So you have the new growth, the newest leaf, one, two, and then anything beyond the two, I chop and throw away and compost. So you're only ensuring that you're having the new growth the new growth will produce flowers and you can, you know, definitely increase. So when you're down, you can even put in a smaller pot if you, you know, get rid of all that old access and then you have the new growth. And then what you can do is you can face the new growth. I always plan, you want to look at an or most orchids, you want to look at one or three points of viewing, right? So you're going to take a new growth on the side, new growth on the middle, and then a new growth on the other side. And this will allow for a, a, a three-sided bloom when they bloom. So you're getting rid of all that access, all that access fluff. If it has two pseudo balls behind the new growth, you're good. Thank you. Um, let's see, we've got someone who is wondering about, well, we've got a couple questions related to viruses. And one is if someone's looking for a virus test kit for their orchid, um, do you have any recommendations in terms of what they should look for to make sure they're getting something that is actually um, going to test their viruses? And then yes. if they think a plant has a virus, is it time to throw in the towel or is there anything that can be done to save the plant? Yeah, so um, that's, those are great questions. So with the virus um, sources for virus uh, test kits, I would recommend going to um, like your local orchid society, American Orchid Society or a vendor that you, um, you know, if you Google in your area, um, orchid vendors, uh, orchid growers, uh, the American Orchid Society also has a great list of vendors that you can use. Most vendors know it's a, it's a problem and it's a challenge. Um, so most vendors that I deal with personally and professionally, they know about the, the virus and they will have um, great recommendations where you can get the products and the products to trust. Um, there's two major brands that um, they will recommend, um, but I definitely would recommend going to them um, to ask them. Um, but you know, quick, quick Google search and they'll, they'll recommend um, which virus test kits to use. Um, on the point of virus, if you suspect, suspect an orchid, it has virus. If you have a large collection, I would isolate it, you know, put it on a windowsill that's not around others. If it's doing fine, that's great. Um, you know, treat it as such. But if you have a big collection and you're worried about it spreading, it might be time to compost um, to discard it, uh, sadly. Um, there is advancements in science that are allowing uh, scientists to actually um, take isolations of the meristem of the plant and then cloning that meristem, they're able to get virus-free stock. But that, that, that takes a special plant, right? It's something that, you know, us at Smithsonian or the U.S. Botanic Garden, if there's an item of significant value, then we would take those for conservation status. But if it's an orchid on your windowsill, it's probably not worth it, unfortunately. So... <laughs> Well, speaking of saving plants, there's a couple of folks who are worried that their orchids have dried out or that they're looking a little wrinkled. Is there any way to bring an orchid back from being parched? Yeah. So I would first recommend, um, you know, it's parched. It looks, looks sad, desiccated. 
I would bring it to your sink and I would remove, you know, get, get some new media and I would repot it. And you want to look at the, you get it out there and look at the roots. You're only seeing what's happening. On, it's like an iceberg, right? You're only seeing the leaves, the flowers. You don't know what's going on in the roots. The roots is also the really main important thing. If the plant has no roots, it may or may not survive. And if it's that, that case, I would recommend getting sphagnum moss. And this is one of the reasons I would say you can use sphagnum moss. And then I would bundle it in the sphagnum moss and put it in the pot. The Spanish, the moss has um, properties that allow, um, they have um, prop, uh, properties to help encourage root growth. Um, you know, that constant moisture. Um, so that's something I would recommend if there's an orchid on the brink. But one of those things you can always... It's not bad if you throw in the towel, you can always start over again and support the industry, so. <laughs> Excellent point. Um, speaking of water, what are your thoughts on water culture instead of media? Um, this person is wondering if they put an inch of water to reach the roots and then letting it dry and then start over, if that's an okay way to grow orchids. Yeah, I, you know, I haven't actually grown orchids in water culture. I've seen plenty of blogs and YouTube videos, but I actually haven't tried it. Um, you know, growing orchids is a lot about experimenting, right? So even growing orchids on your, you're being a little mini scientist and a plant scientist. Um, I would say have at it, try it, you know, um, you know, some of the, the things that I've seen, I'm like, oh yeah, if it works for you, it works. Um, yeah, I would, I would say, you know, give it a try. I mean, I personally haven't tried it, but there's definitely some blogs out there that have step-by-step -step instructions and it would make sense that it possibly could work depending on the genera that you're utilizing. Thanks, Justin. Um, this person is wondering, they have a large Oncidium that flowered beautifully once, but has mm -hmm. shriveled up in some areas. After your recommendations, they think they need to repot. And their question is, how do I go about repotting a fragile, grumpy orchid? So I would recommend, you know, taking it, um, usually get some newspaper down because it's going to make a mess. Uh, horticulture is messy, so don't, you know, just have at it. Uh, get some secretaries or sears, and you're going to look at the plant. Naturally, if it's older, it's going to want to fall apart. Once you take it, you remove the media, toss it around, you know, just move it around a little bit. It should naturally fall apart. And you'll see, you'll be able to tell where the, the turgid pseudobulbs are that are full of plump of water versus the ones that are, you know, senescing and dried up. You'll, what you'll do with that is you can do one pseudobulb or two pseudobulbs and then do the same thing, like I said, with the cat layers, just pot it back in um, and then throw away all that extra. Thanks, Justin. And then we'll take, uh, let's see, one more question here, which is someone has phalaenopsis, but the leaves are splitting up the middle. Any recommendations? Yeah, so it sounds like that plant had some stressors, whether it was not enough light or it got dry one time, or sometimes you, you hit it wrong and then it, <laughs> it breaks. Um, what will happen eventually, those leaves will senesce, but it might take a few years. It usually takes, um, Phalaenopsis usually put out new leaves um, every year. And so, um, you know, it may take three or four years, but I would leave it. Eventually those leaves will become the old leaves and then the new leaves will take over that, that, that place on that plant. Thanks, Justin. And I know we didn't get to every question today. If folks still have orchid questions, do you recommend um, how they might either reach out to you or some great sort of orchid growing um, troubleshooting tips out there? Yeah, I would recommend, um, you know, go, you can definitely go to Smithsonian Gardens Instagram. Um, that's a way that um, we've been able to get a lot of questions answered. Um, our social media coordinator reaches out to me pretty much every week with questions that we have. Um, so if you go to SG Gardens uh, on Instagram, definitely check it out. You can see it in the chat. Um, definitely follow that for more orchid content, um, our exhibitions that we put on and various educational resources. Um, if you just message SG Gardens, um, they will uh, forward that to me and I can answer your questions. I know I saw there were some questions about Vandas and other genera. Um, feel free to shoot those to that. And I'm sorry we didn't have enough time. There's a lot, a lot to cover, um, but thank you so much. But I definitely would recommend um, using those resources um, and come visit us sometime, right? Either virtually or in person. Thank you so much, Justin, and thank you to everyone who joined us today for this program.